to call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Um, that brings us to item 2.02, .02, board certifies closed session. May I have a motion, please? Um, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second, please. Second. We moved and seconded. Any discussion? Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. That brings us to item 3.01, the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to, oh, David Degaroff. Hey, come on up. Um, please come up and um, say, lead us in the pledge. David is a sixth grader uh, at Berkeley Middle School, and he enjoys scouting and tennis. Hi, David. How are you? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic and one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Good job. Excuse me. Sir, will you take the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Zombie. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Item 3.03, .03, approval of the agenda. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the agendas presented this evening. Second. Second. Any discussion? Been moved and seconded. Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Brings us to item 4.01, an announcement superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair. As you're probably aware, May is Bike Month. One of the biggest events planned for the month is the Safe Routes to School Spring Bicycle Rodeo, which will be held on Saturday, May 20th from 9 to 11. In partnership with Jim City County Police Department, Bike Walk Williamsburg and the City of Williamsburg, Norge Elementary and Quarter Path Recreation Centre will be the host sites. The Bicycle Rodeo is an opportunity to teach children the skills and precautions they need to ride a bicycle safely. Also at the rodeo, students can get their bikes and helmets safely checked. Just as a reminder, SOL testing is in full swing at our schools and will continue throughout the month of May. Please check your child's individual school website for current information regarding testing dates. And, and remember, students need a good night's sleep and a healthy breakfast each day so they can do their best on the test. Congratulations to third grade Stonehouse Elementary student Mariana Gayton for earning first place in her grade level in the WHRO Young Storytellers Contest. Her story, One Inch Tall, is imaginative and funny. She was interviewed and recorded on TV reading her story, and her interview and reading will air on WHRO, Cox Channel 15, on Sunday, May 28th at 5.30 p.m. Applications are now being accepted for the Division's three innovative high school initiatives. At Warhill High School, applications for the Pathways Project will be accepted through May 24th. At Jamestown High School, rising ninth grade students zoned for Jamestown can apply for Concourse 9 until May 18th. And Lafayette High School, rising ninth graders can apply for Link 5 until May 17th. For more information about these three programs, please visit each high school's website or contact the schools directly. It is also my pleasure tonight to formally introduce to the board and community the two new assistant superintendents for school leadership appointed at our last school board meeting. Both have over 10 years experience as principals, sound knowledge of instruction and experience in coaching other leaders to improve performance. Mr. Thorpe has been appointed assistant superintendent of school leadership for elementary schools he has vast experience working with Title I schools and closing the, the achievement gap for disadvantaged students. 
Under his leadership, Matthew Whaley Elementary School was designated as a Distinguished Title I School and achieved the Virginia Board of Education Distinguished Achievement Award. This year, Mr. Thorpe has supervised and coached elementary principals and as Director of Accountability and Special Programs, he has led the improvement process for all schools in WJCC. Mr. Thorpe, if you would please stand where you are and be recognized. Thank you for agreeing to serve your new, in your new, new leadership role in WJCC. Dr. Carroll has been appointed Assistant Superintendent of School Leadership for Middle and High Schools. Dr. Carroll has served in leadership positions at the elementary, middle and high school levels. He has considerable experience in closing the achievement gap and during his leadership of Warhill High, his both SOL path, pass rates and graduation rates improved dramatically. At Warhill, he has initiated innovative programs such as Project Lead the Way, Early College, Pathways, and the Governor's STEM Academy for Engineering and Information Technology. Dr. Carroll also co-leads the WJCC mentoring program for new principals and assistant principals for the last two years. Dr. Carroll, could you please stand and be recognized at the back? Thank you for agreeing to serve in your new leadership role in WJCC. Those are all of my announcements this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Uh, Ms. Ownby? Yes, I have two committee reports. I attended the Special Education Advisory Committee on May 11th. Um, they worked on their annual report to the board, which they'll present to us in June. They will draft their bylaws this summer and plan to bring those to the board in September for our review and approval. I shared the revised policy on public comment and speaker card instructions and wanted to let the community know that One Child Center for Autism will continue to have their monthly respite night for students with special education needs um, in May, June, July, and August. So I encourage folks to go to the One Child Center for Autism website to get more information. This is a great resource for um, children, preschool age to teenage, um, it's free for students with identified um, special education needs and it's $5 for their um, siblings. And I encourage my colleagues on the school board to go attend one night. Um, we have student volunteers, I know Lafayette Key Club and probably Jamestown and Warhill as well participate and volunteer. It's, they serve over 100 students and so it's a great opportunity to see um, our students at their, at their best and uh, to see our students with special needs in, in that environment. And then I wanted to highlight a fantastic partnership that I just learned about with, at James River Elementary School um, along with the ARC of Williamsburg, which is a nonprofit program that provides support and advocacy for folks with intellectual disabilities. Ms. Hummel and I learned a little bit about this program when we were at James River, but I didn't understand the depth um, of this particular partnership and was invited by the chair of the SEAC, the Special Education Advisory Committee, Julie Culifer, who is also in leadership at James River, to come in and visit and, and see firsthand this incredible partnership and wanted to share this with the broader community. Uh, for a little over a year, the ARC has a day support program that's been based at the Abrams Fink Rec Center, which is co-located at James River. And this day, day support program offers adults with intellectual disabilities the opportunity to develop job skills through lessons and community volunteer opportunities. Some of our Williamsburg, Jameson County sped ed students who graduate from HAR are school systems who won't go on to post-secondary or who won't have jobs or who are waiting for Medicaid waiver um, vocational services might very well use this program. Um, so clients in this program volunteer with James River, but they also work with various other community agencies in a volunteer capacity, so their spot at the rec center next to James River is their, their home spot. Because of the proximity, Mr. Stutt, the principal at James River and the James River PTA leadership reached out to the ARC um, and developed some volunteer opportunities. So uh, the clients of the ARC um, work in collaboration with teachers um, some of the, the clients work in classrooms, they shelve library books, um, they help the information boards. Uh, the neatest experience that I think is the classroom experience. This year they hope to have, they have a handful of clients working in their K-2 inclusion classrooms. They hope to expand this um, and they, uh, they've created a, a, an incredible volunteer um, experience. It's a win-win because um, students 
of James River in the K-2 classrooms who have disabilities themselves have an opportunity to see young adults with disabilities um, being valued um, as a volunteer. These young people are helping in the classroom and with other activities that would normally need to be completed by teachers or teachers' aides on their own time instead of working directly with students. So the ARC clients are um, placed in a classroom to help with reading time. Many of these clients are on elementary reading level. Um, which is perfect for these K-2 um, children. So the James River students are practicing their reading. The ARC clients are using their reading skills. So it's reinforcing everyone's reading skills. What I saw were ARC clients who have become independent with their volunteer responsibilities by having PTA and ARC staff train and support them in their volunteer responsibilities. And this prepares them for employment in the community. Two of those clients have, have, received, have become employed um, after their volunteer um, experience at James River. Some of the ARC clients are request, requested specifically by the James River students. What I saw were the ARC clients who were very positive and engaging, high-fiving the James River students as they were practicing the reading skills. It was a wonderful partnership. Um, I, I think there's potential to expand that and, and hope that we can and look at ways that we can partner more with the, the ARC Day Support Program um, to have those clients work at additional libraries in the school system um, or in other classrooms. It's a perfect partnership. Um, then wanted to report on the Student Advisory Committee. I attended that on May 10th. Dr. Heron wrapped up the focus group, um, was asking our students um, of the three high schools what has been positive about their high school experience, what um, could be improved, and what are some initiatives they would like to see down the road for their peers. Um, this information will be compiled and will be reported to the board in June. I did ask um, students about redistricting to get their point of view um, about that. Asked them specifically about feeder schools. Um, there wasn't a, a, a strong opinion one way or the other. Um, if they thought it would make a huge impact to have a core group of middle, middle school students follow them onto high school. Some students said they were ready to have um, new relationships. Others thought it might be helpful to, have, to know that a core group would follow them from middle school to high school. Um, but when asked specifically about splitting neighborhoods, they were all unanimously um, opposed to that and felt like if they had to be redistricted out of a school and into a new school, um, having their entire neighborhood, neighborhood go with them would mitigate um, some of, of the, the change that goes along with redistricting. Um, another recommendation was to allow students who are currently in a high school to finish in that high school. Districting does take place. Um, that's it for my reports. Thank you. Any, anyone, anyone else? Uh, yeah. No. Do, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I had an opportunity to um, go out to Warhill High School and um, take a look at the wrestling team facilities out there. Um, Ken Edwards, the athletic director, invited me out there uh, with one of his uh, former wrestlers. Uh, Mr. Matthews, um, who is Mike, Mike and uh, Matthew's son, um, I had already seen the wrestling facilities out at Lafayette, um, and um, uh, I have not yet seen the athletic facilities um, at, the, I'm sorry, that was at uh, Jamestown. No, it was at Jamestown. I hadn't seen the one at. Uh, ever. One of the things that um, struck me um, is um, they're, they're in need of help. Those facilities, uh, I've been, I was a high school college wrestler. I know what facility, good facilities look like. Um, and um, what I would remind uh, the board and the public is uh, oh, 10 or 12, maybe 15 years ago, that's when wrestling was introduced when you search in Kenny, James City County Schools. And with a lot of excitement, and people were really interested in it and uh, got behind it. Uh, we're, we were feeling some uh, respectable teams. Uh, but there's a cost to that. The cost is um, uh, facilities. Um, and um, I, those facilities uh, really need some help. But the other part that it reminded me of is there is a lot of talk now. Um, and, uh, and growing interest in uh, developing uh, lacrosse at each of the high schools. And all I would um, uh, remind people uh, and the board is that um, when you make decisions to bring athletic programs on, online, sooner or later, you're going to have to pay for the facilities. And, 
And it's really important to keep that in mind. I would hate to have um, what has uh, happened to the wrestling facilities uh, happen to um, potential uh, lacrosse teams. So I, uh, I, I just felt that was uh, really important to go out there and see and just remember, because I do remember when um, the three high schools did field and still do field competitive wrestling programs, and they're excited about the programs, and uh, and and they are getting better. Um, but um, the facilities that they are expected to use uh, really need to be improved. And I think when you have athletic program uh, for a program like that that's been around over ten years, um, you have to you have to take a closer look at that. And if that means um, doing a, um, a, a broader facilities uh, sort of survey, uh, we have to do that. But I, the only reason I brought it up, though, was because I know that there, because I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of calls from uh, parents of kids who are on lacrosse clubs, want to know what do we have to do so that we can, that could become part of the athletic programs at uh, three high schools. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly. Uh, Madam Chair, on Thursday we have our retirement ceremony and uh, we award our service pins to our, to our long-serving employees. Um, uh, and, I, and I respect and admire all of our retirees. But I look out tonight and I see Mr. T Mr. Tyler in the back there, Earl Tyler, who is retiring this year after many, many years in our transportation um, uh, department and uh, if you have never been in transportation on the first day of school um, <laughs> you have not been someplace I mean that is uh, amazing so I just want to take this opportunity to recognize Mr. Tyler and um, hope that on the first day of school next year you're on a beach somewhere looking out over the ocean <laughs> so, so thank you Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other announcements? Um, I just was going to say that if I wasn't here tonight, I would be watching the Jamestown Lafayette lacrosse game <laughs> at 7 o'clock uh, on Field 5 at the uh, War Hill Complex. Can we stream that? Is that? I don't, I don't know, but it's supposed to be a good game. So. All right, that brings us to 5.01, board recognitions. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have lots of wonderful recognitions tonight. Uh, tonight's recognitions allow us not only to recognize students for their outstanding accomplishments, but also to give thanks to WJCC business partners, volunteers, and outstanding support staff. WJCC is honored to recognize three of our valued business partners for being named to the Virginia School Boards Association 2017 Business <coughs> Honor Roll. Their ongoing commitment and support of our students in schools is very much appreciated. Not only do we appreciate and depend on their collaboration, but we are thankful that we can highlight some of their many contributions to our school division. As your business is called, will representatives here tonight join us up front to be recognized and remain up front until each business has been called? First of all, the Ball Corporation. Ball Corporation has sponsored WJC's Manufacturing Day since the program's inception. Students tour their facility and learn about 21st century skills needed in jobs today and also about the types of products that are made right here in Williamsburg. Ball team members also present our high school career day, day programs. Thank you. Second, Powerhouse Dance. Powerhouse Dance offers a scholarship program to create community-based opportunities in the arts. Prompted by their focus on health and well-being, the studio staff also supports our ship program, field days, and other health-related activities in our schools. Trader Joe's.
Peter Joes has provided us with a nice goodies bag tonight as well, apparently. Thank you very much. I see the fearless flyer is in the bag also. Uh, Trader Joe's supports our Race the Need program by providing food and volunteers for the distribution program. They, don they donate bags for the backpack program and even provide flowers to help families feel special. Trader Joe's also supports our students and teachers through various other school-based programs and donations. Partnerships with these businesses provide community engagement opportunities that enrich educational experiences for our students. Thank you so much for supporting our schools. For the second consecutive year, we are pleased to recognize a few of our most dedicated volunteers. WJC's Outstanding Volunteer of the Year recognition program was established to show appreciation for the unwavering support and advocacy volunteers provide to help students and schools be successful. Each school identified one volunteer who epitomizes WJCC's core values. And tonight we want to thank these individuals for their contributions and partnerships. Volunteers, as your name is called, please join us up front and remain for a group photo. From Clara Bird Baker, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Jimmy Connors. <laughs> DJ Montague, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Shannon Hassan. J. Blaine Blayton, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Shannon Rickard. <laughs> James River, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Isabel Cantrell. Matthew Whaley, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Ruth McMahon. <laughs> Batoka, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, John Barone. George, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Michael Willen. <laughs> Rawls Bird, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Muriel Slaughter. Stonehouse Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Pat McElroy. <laughs> Berkeley Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Dara Bright. <laughs> Hornsby Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Kim Squire. Tuano Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Laurie Rogers. <laughs> J. 
Jamestown Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Katie Maloney. Lafayette Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Lisa Stoddard. <laughs> Warhill Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, Anne Oman. In addition to our school-based volunteers, we would like to celebrate the volunteer work of Michelle Wormsley. She was named Peninsula District PTA Volunteer of the Year at the elementary level. Thank you again, outstanding volunteers. We truly value all of the work you do to help our students and our schools. Just under one half of the Williamsburg Gem City County Public School employees work in support positions. And these employees are an integral part of the, of the division's success. To honor our excellent staff, we distinguish these, these individuals through the Support Employee of the, Rec of the Year Recognition Program. One support employee from each school and non-school-based department was selected by their peers and colleagues. We appreciate these employees' commitment to our schools, departments, and most importantly, to our students. Employees, as your name is called, please come up front and remain until all employees have been recognized. From bright beginnings, support employee of the year, Carla Javier. Clara Bird Baker, Support Employee of the Year, Christine Moore. <laughs> DJ Montague, Support Employee of the Year, Nikki Montero. Jay Blaine Blayton, Support Employee of the Year, Heather Hastings. <laughs> James River, Support Employee of the Year, Laura Harris. Matthew Whaley, Support Employee of the Year, Judy Pauley. <laughs> Matoka, Support Employee of the Year, Sherry Brinkley. Norge, Support Employee of the Year, Judy Falks.
Rawls Bird Support Employee of the Year, Norma Spogwaski. Stonehouse Support Employee of the Year, Marissa Brodas. Berkeley Support Employee of the Year, Lisa Kelly. Lois S. Hornsby Support Employee of the Year, Elizabeth Solasis. Lucis, sorry. Thank you. I've got some coaching here. Tuano Support Employee of the Year, Karen Hundley. Jamestown Support Employee of the Year, Mary Lou Patterson. Warhill Support Employee of the Year, Kathleen Speed. <laughs> Central Office Support Employee of the Year, Susan Rowe. Operation Support Employee of the Year, Tom Williams. <laughs> Technology Support Employee of the Year, Kerry Crum. Trans uh, Transportation Support Employee of the Year, Lois Delk. again for all the incredible work you do for our school system. We really appreciate you. We would also like to congratulate members of the Lafayette um, ath athletes who are named to the All-State Swimming Team this evening and head coach uh, Mr. Harold Baker is here to announce the students' names this evening. Mr. Baker. Does it come down? Okay. We're going to, uh, we'd like to congratulate the Lafayette swimmers, as she said, who made the All-State swim team this year. 
and swimmers, as I call your name, if you'll please come forward to be recognized and then remain in the front for the group photo. So we'll start out with Flynn Creasy. Emma Freiling. Henry Gaston. Colby Hurt. Chris Costelny. Sam Long. Sophia Long. Olivia Nice. Grace Olson. Finn Sensible. Madam Chair and Vice Chair, that concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. That was a remarkable ensemble of people, much, much talent, much to be thankful for. Um, that brings us to item 5.02, School Spotlight. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're pleased this evening to have Warhill High School present the school spotlight, and Dr. Jeff Carroll, principal of Warhill High School, will make the presentation this evening. Good evening, Dr. Heron, uh, members of the school board. Uh, thank you for uh, having us here tonight to just talk for a few minutes about uh, a change that we've made in the uh, breakfast program at, at War Hill High School, and we've uh, been very happy with. Uh, and so tonight here with uh, me also is uh, Jane Haley, our Director of Food Services, and then uh, also one of my uh, fine seniors from War Hill, Angela uh, Guerrero Escobar, has uh, joined us tonight to talk about this, uh, the change and uh, the impact for her and some of her peers. Well, the first thing is, why change school breakfast? Uh, if any of the board members or, or anyone else in the audience, if you've visited War Hill prior to February, or I would uh, guess to say any of our, our high schools, uh, typically uh, the breakfast, you've got uh, over a 1,000 students wandering in, worried about getting to class at the start of the day. Uh, some social interaction, but everyone kind of hurried to get to where they need to be. Uh, lots of, uh, you would observe, fast food bags and beverages from uh, outside uh, places. And, you know, just a, a focus of hurry up, get to where you need to be, and really kind of a herding of students and not a uh, warm or friendly start to the day. And beyond that, uh, we know that a hungry child can't, can't learn. And uh, in the past year, especially for us as high school principals, uh, there have been several initiatives to kind of bring this to our attention. Uh, the No Hungry Kid Virginia, and then also uh, the First Lady has uh, started an initiative, um, the Virginia Breakfast Challenge, uh, and particularly designed uh, challenging high school principals throughout the Commonwealth to increase breakfast participation. Uh, and so knowing about those challenges uh, and uh, made me begin to think during the year that uh, maybe this was something that we needed to tackle. Uh, but in all fairness, I, I needed a push. I needed a little nudge. And uh, 
have some uh, collaboration from our WJC stakeholders that uh, did that for me. And then Jane came over and visited in February. Actually, we came over a little bit earlier than that because we had to give okay. him a little Maybe more Jane, of a push. I'll give yeah. you a little more credit yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, in, in early December, uh, Amy Lazif with uh, the SHIP program and uh, Pam Dannon, the registered dietitian for CNS and SHIP, uh, we went to visit Dr. Carroll and we had some uh, very staggering statistics that were pretty dismal for Warhill with the number of uh, students that we were free feeding breakfast. And we went kind of with their information in hand with the hope of persuading him to let us do something different with breakfast. Um, we ended up being able to do something even greater than we had hoped for. We were hoping that we'd be able to change a few things, maybe put in a, a cart here or there and uh, offer some different um, opportunities for breakfast. And we talked about lots of different things, and then we were able to uh, make it end up uh, much greater in our favor, which has uh, increased our numbers substantially uh, and enabled us to offer um, even greater items for them to purchase than we had initially thought. So as Jane said, after that, that meeting, uh, they challenged us to really think about uh, how we serve breakfast at Warhill. And uh, with uh, the help of my uh, admin team and some other people at, at Warhill, it led us, you know, as Jane said, we first started looking at just breakfast and maybe extending having a second breakfast option. But as we really uh, dug into the matter, uh, we talked about how could we help that and address some of that issue of climate and welcoming our students and how our uh, teenagers start the day. Uh, and so what we did was we uh, moved our academic enrichment period from the middle of the day uh, to the first part of the day. Uh, so now we're serving breakfast from uh, 7 a.m. to 7.50 and providing lots of other opportunities. So uh, what does it look like? Came through the the line. Uh, one of the things that became a hit with the was we also with food services added uh, some new options uh, with the uh, coffee cart and then smoothies. Um, I think it was what our our first week where we actually burned out the smoothie blender. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we overheated one of the blenders and very quickly learned that we needed to have two so that we could alternate because. One was not enough. Uh, we had a very overwhelming response to the smoothies, and one, even though it's commercial, just did not keep up. So we've got a, a backup smoothie blender at all times now at, at Warhill. Uh, and there we go. We've got a, a picture of the, the one of the ones that cranks out smoothies for us. There's, uh, Odessa Jackson, our cafeteria manager, getting the smoothies uh, ready. Now, uh, I'll let Jane explain part of the... the benefit of this is now a smoothie with a whole grain, is it yeah. correct, counts as a meal? Right. If they get, combine it with a whole grain because it is a fruit and yogurt smoothie, it does count as a meal for the breakfast reimbursement so that all students are able to participate. Um, we're up to about 200 breakfast meals per day, which is a, a big increase over what we were doing there before. Um, they actually are making about 300 smoothies a day because they can also purchase the smoothie a la carte. It, the, one of the big reasons that it is such a big success is they're not making them the day before and freezing them ahead. They're actually making them fresh that morning. So they um, they hit the ground. Well, Odessa actually hits the ground running about 5.30. The rest of the staff gets there about 6.30. They pre-assemble all of their items the day before so that they're ready to get there and start blending right at 6.30 so that they're ready for the crowd. So again, one of the things uh, they've done is increase the, uh, the breakfast options that we have there. Um, and we also have added the, the coffee cart. And what we've done for our, our students, uh, uh, a few things. By moving AAP to the, uh, the start of the day, uh, we've really tried to give students a uh, choice. Um, on a typical morning now, uh, we probably estimate estimate that we have uh, four to 500 students uh, in the student center. And we've given students the choice of either attending their academic enrichment period, that they're uh, old enough and mature enough uh, to make the choice of whether they need to go seek that remedial help or that accelerated help that they can get from their teacher during that time, 
or they can choose to start off the day by having breakfast and spending that time in the cafeteria, socializing, catching up with their friends, uh, having that kind of soft start to the day. Um, and that has made a, a huge difference, we think. Um, what we see, uh, we've seen a, a reduce in our number of tardies uh, to first block. Uh, we've had a decrease in uh, skipping and other incidents, uh, incidents uh, during the middle of the day because once we start our day, uh, we're focused on academics. Um, and then along with the idea of student choice, um, throughout the year, um, my senior class had been asking me for uh, a senior privilege. And so we incorporated uh, that into the program also. So uh, one of the lenses that we look at all our students with um, are we call our ABC, attendance, behavior, and credits. And so seniors who are uh, doing well in all three of those areas were eligible now for a pass, and uh, they don't have to uh, be on campus during AEP. And so they can actually arrive, uh, as research shows, that a soft start for them. And uh, as long as they're in first block by the start of uh, 750, they get to make that choice. Um, I brought Angela. I wanted to just talk for a moment about the impact as a, a senior the, with that pass and uh, some of the other changes. Hello. Um... It's actually very nice that we have smoothies. Uh, I, every, every morning, I usually, when I wake up, make my protein smoothie. And uh, it's when I get to school, before we had the advantage of getting a smoothie, it usually be melted. Uh, usually, like, it kind of tastes like juice. But now that we have smoothies at school, it's actually frozen, and you can actually taste it as a smoothie. Um, and we have coffee, so I can stay awake, caffeine inside me. <laughs> and then we actually have the AP uh, privilege. It's actually very nice. It gives me an extra few minutes to get ready. If I woke up late, I can come in as before 7.50, get there in class, be on time. And then um, it's actually very nice that we have a lot of other things instead of like little small things. Like we have the naked juices, too. Those are really good, too. And we have um, cookies or <laughs> and then um, this is really it's really nice for other students and and my friends and I it's it's a small meal because we don't really eat in the mornings but it's a very nice thing that we can just have something to grab and go and we can not like have to munch and have crumbs all over each other. Yeah. And just as uh, we put a few quick numbers up there for you to to show some of the impact just uh, since February. Uh, as Jane said, typically they were serving uh, around 75 breakfast meals uh, before. Now it's uh, 200 or more each morning. Our free and reduced lunch, lunch participation in uh, the breakfast program has increased from 20% to 42% of those students. You know, our serving window has increased uh, up to 50 minutes now. And our first block tardies, uh, you know, just uh, in a short period of time, uh, we've seen a uh, significant uh, re reduction in the, not only the number of tardies, but the actual number of students who are having tardies to class. Uh, and we see that as a, as a positive also. Uh, so let's uh, come on out to, uh, to breakfast. Uh, Jane, we couldn't uh, provide samples tonight. I, I tried to convince <laughs> her to do that. Uh, but you know, we were unable to do that, so the next best thing I can do is uh, offer an extended invitation to uh, each of you to come on out, and uh, I'll tell Jane will tell you that Jane will buy it for you. So, yeah. <laughs> no. okay. Thank you. Want to have any comments or questions, Ms. Ombi? Um, I think this is great, and I hope that we can consider expanding this to all of our high schools. And I think the soft start, and especially giving the seniors the opportunity to come in a little bit late resonate with some of our students who've come in to speak to us about later start times and so even if we're not able to address that now um, that's a nice way that we can allow students to sleep in sometimes I know some of our student athletes you know sometimes get home late 9 30 at night after a game and then they put in a couple hours of, of homework and then they go to bed at 11 12 o'clock at night and then they have to be up and out the door at 6 30 and so if they have that, that late start with eight, that's great 
Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's fabulous. I, I don't understand how a student at 4:30 in the morning could have a, 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 a major appetite. But I just think this is you know for a lot of kids, for a lot of students, it, it's a great way. It, it's right there. It's like they probably do. Some of them probably stumble in there, not quite awake. But I, and this is wonderful. I think I think it's a and I. I so I'm said, I, I'd love to see this in the other, uh, other high schools and even even the middle schools. Yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's great. I think it's a great um, yeah, I think you should franchise this. <laughs> <laughs> Make a lot of money for the school system. Uh, I did have a question about the AEP and um, what, uh, what were some of the teachers' responses to students that were struggling? Were they not taking uh, advantage of AEP as much, you know, like what was the end result for AEP participation? I think you... AEP participation is still, uh, still the same, you know, the students that, that need the help, it, it's there. Um, but again, the idea of student choice where I may not need help in all four of my classes, so we were forcing them on some days to an AEP session that I'm doing really well in this class, why, why am I sitting here for 20, 25 minutes where I'd rather put my headphones in or I'd rather have that cup of coffee now in the morning or have a smoothie um, and hang out with my friends and maybe I only do that on Wednesdays. Um, so we're, we're trusting our students to make those choices. Do they always make the right choice? No, but that's you know up to us to help them get better at making those choices and guide them and um, encourage them to be where they need to be if they need some extra assistance. But I, I think it's a great, a great program all around. Hi. Yeah, you know, you know I have questions. Um, so um, can you talk to me a little bit about what's in the smoothies? I was at the March of Lions, not this past year, but the last year, and I had one with carrots in it, and it was really good. So is that what this is, or is it just, they look like strawberries, so I just want to. We have several recipes. Uh, the ones that they're doing at Warhill, they have a triple berry, which has blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries, and they have a strawberry banana. Uh, they are also doing them at Jamestown. Jamestown has a mango and a tropical fruit and a peach. Warhill also has a peach. Um, and they kind of rotate around, you know. So no carrots. They do have some that they put carrots in. You know, it just kind of depends on the day. <laughs> yeah. um, and then can you talk, do you have plans to expand this to uh, any other cafeterias in the division? Or can you talk about what you're thinking? Yes, we've, we've, we've both had that, that yeah. conversation. So I've in, invited uh, Dr. Worley and Ms. Winton to, to have some of their staff visit. Um, I know uh, food services would, you know, we've been pleased with uh, you know, the numbers and the impact that it's had. So we're hopeful that we'll expand that. I just want to commend you for your innovation. Um, you know, the, as you mentioned, the First Lady of Virginia has really taken this issue um, under her wing and has expanded breakfast programs all over the state um, and has provided funding uh, for that, but not, not really here um, because we don't qualify for anything. So I think the fact that you made this work anyway um, is to be commended, and I, I want to thank you because more kids um, particularly kids on free and reduced lunch and participation at the high school level is so difficult and challenging. So I really commend you for making sure that kids have full bellies so that they can learn. And um, thank you very much. It's, um, you should be very proud of yourselves because... Um, Fantastic. And this got national coverage, didn't it? Didn't the Gazette's... Yes. Yeah, it was picked up by the uh, School Nutrition Association in their magazine as well as the Dietetics in their magazine and one other national publication. So Mrs. Hummel wants you to franchise it locally, but it sounds like you might be going <laughs> national. <laughs> I, I apologize, Madam Chair. Um, what is the serving window again? What time? What time do you start? Start 6.55 to 7.50. 6.55 to 7.50. Okay, I, I'm driving to Charlottesville on Friday, so I'll <laughs> see you there. Please stop by. I'll see you there. There you go. Good. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You bring up an interesting idea, Mr. Kelly. You, you might have a vibe. It will let you in the student morning. center door if you have your senior pass. Okay. <laughs> I may be a little late. Okay. Okay, great. Anything else before we move on to? Okay, great. That brings us to, thank you very thank much, you. Um, thank you. Angela and Dr. Carroll and Ms. Haley. We appreciate it very much. 
Um, that brings us to 6.01 citizen comments. Uh, we have one speaker for yes. tonight. So, Ms. Hummel. Okay, let me see. We have this. Um, 30 minutes is allotted for public comment. Each speaker may have, have up to three minutes to address the school board with a limit of 30 minutes of citizen comments. We only have what, Ms. We only have one comment card tonight, yeah, Ms. Hunley, yes. and Ms. Hunley knows all the rules, so I am just going to let her come on up and go for it. Ms. Taylor yes, will Kim announce Hunley. Her name. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I wasn't going to speak, but when I went to put my goodies up there, I saw that you already had goodies. So then I thought, well, I better qualify that. The one from the association is a flower with a quote <laughs> on the back that kind of says, like, growth and comfort cannot coexist. So that's something to ponder on as you get ready for redistricting. Um, also, uh, Mr. Thorpe complimented me on my outfit when I first came. <laughs> he said, I know you're going to speak for that outfit. What he did know is that these are men's shirts, like, kind of like the one you have on right there. So the lady that did this repurposes men's shirts. But he actually noticed it and he complimented me, which really made me feel good because when I bought this for Mother's Day on the street, from a street vendor at Second Sundays, my daughter was like, you are not going to wear that. That is so ugly. <laughs> so to get a compliment from him really made my day. And I felt good in it today. But also I wanted my members to know that I am usually here every time. And... Um, to know that I am representing them and we have a great relationship and I'd like to keep it that way and so um, that's all I have to say but enjoy your chocolate <laughs> very much okay that brings us to the consent agenda um, which is item 7.01 approval of minutes from the April 11th 2017 and the April 18th 2017 meetings 7.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, April 2017. 7.03, personnel actions as presented. 7.04, approved release from compulsory, att uh, compulsory attendance, case number R17-05. 7.05, revise, recode, and rename policy BDDB, agenda preparation, dissemination, and format to policy BDDC, agenda preparation and dissemination. Revise policy BDDH slash KD, public participation at school board meetings. 7.07, .07, adoption of policy JFCC, student conduct on school buses. 7.08, retire policy EEACC, student conduct on school buses. 7.09, revise policy IGD, extracurricular activities. 7.10, retire policy IGDC, student social events. And finally, 7.11, retire policy IGDI, intramural programs. May I please have a motion? Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda 7.01, approval of minutes as presented this evening, please. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. All right, that brings us to item 8.01, transfer of funds and purchase approval for the middle school and high school projects. Is that, yeah, um, personalized learning and high school pathways projects to electronic systems incorporated in the amount of $350,077. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the transfer of fiscal year 2017 funds and award purchase of materials for the middle school personalized learning and high school pathways projects to electronic systems incorporated in the amount of $350,077. A second, please. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Dr. Heron, would you like to? Um, this was discussed last time. We're actually buying all of the middle school and high school technology needs that were in next year's budget in this year's budget instead using attrition funds uh, and that gets us a uh, gives us the ability to balance the budget any questions we moved and seconded we call the roll please Ms. Serza Ms. Hummel aye Mr. Kelly aye Ms. Ownby aye Mrs. Taylor aye Mrs. Young aye Dr. Beers aye 
Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to item 8.02, adoption of the amended fiscal year 2018 operating budget. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, as a member of the school board of Williamsburg James City oh, County, sorry. Thank you. I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2017-18 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for that reminder. Um, I'd like to also add that as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018 school budget because I am an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you. So we did a, did we do a motion? In no, a we second? did not do Can a motion. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval, of adoption of the amended fiscal year 2018 operating budget. I have a second, please. Second. Dr. Heron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Bird is here to very briefly present some of the changes that have been made to, to balance the budget before the school board votes this evening. Thank you, Ms. Bird. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Um, we are at the final stage of our operating budget development for fiscal year 18. Um, just a, a note that the county and city did not fully fund our request as sent to them um, in March which requires a reduction or an adjustment of $754,211 in order to balance our budget for fiscal year 18. The recommended expenditures to keep in our school board adopted budget are the following. A step increase for teachers and a 1.5% salary increase for administrative and support staff for a total of $1,118,050. The required VRS rate increase from 14.66 to 16.32% as well as the VRS required health insurance credit rate increase from 1.11% to 1.23% for 1.5 million. The increased school operation allocation due to an additional enrollment at our elementary, middle, and high school levels, $12,854. The addition of four special education teachers, 300,000. Two special education teacher assistants, 70,000. One English as a second language teacher, 75,000. The principal for James Blair Middle School, 135,000. Three school improvement specialists for our middle schools, 250,000. Two teaching positions to hold for pathway special education or enrollment if needed, 150,000. The adjustment to the New Horizons Regional Program for 251,637. An increase for our virtual learning program of 100,000. The expansion of the early college program to Jamestown and Lafayette, 90,000. The Pathways Project at Warhill second year, instructional materials and transportation cost, 45,000. Contractual obligations, 667,364. Redistricting, 150,000. The strategic plan development, 30,000. Translation services for division-wide documents, 25000 A modification to health insurance for a $50 per month charge to health plan with spouses, 189250 What we are recommending to adjust, uh, as you know, this process is about a year-long process. So when we begin to develop the budget, we are estimating uh, the cost that will be applied to contractual obligations. I am happy to report that as we get closer to the end of this um, process, we do get actual information regarding our general liability insurance, workers' compensation, and unemployment insurance, which came in favorable for us, as well as the hiring of staff where we had additional budget that we we're able to adjust that. So in this budget, we can reduce 136567 because of those changes. Based on the action you just took in the previous agenda item, we can reduce the Technology Cost Center by 348000 And we can utilize an additional anticipated attrition savings of 269644 which would take our total attrition savings built into the fiscal year 18 budget of $1,269,644. With those modifications, our operating budget will be $131,292,393 or an increase of $3,722,589. Our grant fund will have an increase of $162,943.
Our state-operated fund for Merrimack and Eastern State will have an increase of $10,402, and our child nutrition fund will have an increase of $16,092, making our total operating budget that we're seeking approval tonight for $141,921,647, an increase of 3912026 or 2.8%. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Berta. Um, yeah, is, um, so are we in uh, agreement with the, the city and the county at this point? The budget that's presented tonight is in alignment with what they have adopted. Okay, perfect. Thank yes. you very much. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. As, as we've gone through this process, um, I have been in... Uh, a, an opponent and have completely disagreed with the health insurance the charge for our health plans to our spouses um, I, I, I'm concerned about how we're going to implement that but beyond that I'm, I'm also um, very concerned about the impact of that to our employees um, our teaching staff but also several of our support employees who um, lots of whom work for the health insurance and this is an additional cost to that um, I've been thanked by teachers and members of the public for that position. Um, I still hold that position. Um, I hope that we will monitor um, uh, this surcharge and how its effect is to our to our our teacher, our support staff, and our families, and and understand what that real impact is. Um, I will vote in support of the budget tonight. Um, I think it's um, it's uh, um, the best budget that we could do. I I, I am. Still concerned uh, at the level of funding that we get from Richmond. Um, I've been, I've said this many a time that that Mounts Bay and uh, the city have done everything that they can to support our school system, and I appreciate all of their all of their sacrifice and work towards that. Uh, the problem is in the General Assembly and in Richmond, and I hope that we will work together to help address that issue. Um, but uh, yes, I will vote in support of the budget tonight. Kelly. Um, I, I also uh, um, will support tonight's budget. I didn't support the initial budget uh, because I thought other cuts um, could either be made and what, uh, or, or additional funds could be found. And um, I am satisfied that um, you have um, rectified that and, and have found remedies so that uh, the funding can go forward. I also share the concern about the um, surcharge for spouses um, and, and very much agree that um, we monitor that uh, over the next year. Okay, um, I want to, um, I also will support this, um, this budget proposal. Um, I want to thank the staff for their hard work. As you said, it's a year-long process. It's never-ending. Um, so good luck starting tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Here. Um, I also want to echo Mr. Kelly's uh, thanks for both of the localities for their support. Um, this budget is not what we asked for. Um, it, we did present um, a budget of need, um, but I think that at the end of the day, it really is the state who is uh, falling down on their uh, constitutional responsibility to fund public education appropriately. Um, and I, uh, I, I am pleased that this budget includes, uh, we were able to maintain the translation services given the data that you shared with us that I think is critically important to make sure that we're engaging all of our students and our families and that they can understand the important documents that, they, that we publish so that they um, can understand what our expectations is, are but also know that they're part of our community um, I'm very pleased we're able to um, preserve the school improvement specialist for the three middle schools because I think that's critically important going forward next year. Um, I, I have to say that um, I would have appreciated only providing a, a raise, however meager, um, and not having to touch insurance premiums. Um, but we had to do something, and the data were clear that this impact impacted the, the fewest number of people uh, in terms of trying to uh, um, recoup some costs in, in the light of the fact that the state just isn't funding this appropriately. So I, I too believe we need to monitor it and I think we need to look at our entire um, compensation package as it, as it pertains to uh, uh, benefits, uh, health benefits, but also um, our entry level uh, salary. So I look forward to 
um, learning more about that over the next year or two. So anyway, with that, if there's no further discussion, that's been moved and seconded, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to item 8.03, adoption of the five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2018, fiscal year 2022, in the amount of $32,865,032. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move adoption of the five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2018 through fiscal year 22. In the amount of $32,865,032. Can I have a second, please? Second. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Bird is going to give us a brief overview of what was funded and what wasn't funded in our capital improvement plan. Thank you, Ms. Bird. Thank you. Uh, the important thing to remember with the capital improvement plan is only the first year of the plan is the funded year. The remaining four years are just a plan. So I will review tonight um, in comparison to what the school board approved capital improvement plan that was passed to the city and county, how it compares up to what was adopted by the city and county. So in fiscal year 18, and one important note, when I say rounding differences, the county and city have a split in our funding that is an odd percentage. So the county funds 90.54%, the city funds 9.46%. So when we ask for things, it's not a clean break like us finance folks like a clean break. So when I say rounding, it's because of that. Um, so we asked for 210000 for Rawlsbird's HVAC replacement design phase. They funded 209852 uh, The Jamestown HVAC replacement design, we asked for three twenty. They funded three twenty. The Lafayette roof replacement, we requested two million six ninety two two thirty four. They have not funded that in fiscal year nineteen. However, they are going to be seeking bond funding in fiscal year nineteen to support this project. The DJ Montague entrance redesign, we requested one hundred and forty thousand. They provided one hundred and forty thousand two hundred sixty nine dollars. The Norge entrance redesign, we requested one hundred and five thousand. They funded one hundred and four thousand nine twenty six. The Berkeley replacement electrical equipment in the 100 and 200 areas, we requested $222,094. They funded $180,031 with a continuation in fiscal year 19 to complete that project. So they've spread it over two years. The Berkeley replacement auditorium seating we requested in fiscal year 18 for $167,633. They have included it in the plan for 19. The Claire Bird Baker exterior mason repairs, we requested $1,311,272. They have funded $1,311,023. DJ Montague parking lot and sidewalk ADA corrections, we requested $80,500. they have provided $80,627. The Toano replacement walk-in freezer and refrigerator, we've asked for $82,400. They provided $82,836. The Jamestown Eves repairs, we requested $86,500. They've provided $86,450. Division wide parking lots, we requested $118,784. They provided $119,150. The division wide replacement fire panels, they have fully funded our request at $105,060. And the Warhill High School Innovation and Maker Space and Chemistry Lab, they have provided 300420 off of a request for 300000 So when we look in total, we have requested in fiscal year 18 5941477 They have funded 3040645 for a difference of 2900832 with those projects pushed to the next fiscal year in the plan. So as we look at we, how we compare in five years, as I stated in 18, we're short funded. However, you can see the increased cost in fiscal year 19 with an additional 5722830 beyond our request. I will note uh, they have removed the Jamestown High School core space and cafeteria expansion from fiscal year 19. 
But the additional funding is because of the movement of the Rawls Bird and Jamestown HVAC. We originally had that in the plan in 19 and 20. They have fully funded those projects in 19. So they've made some shifts in our project based on where they think they're going to have funding to support those. Um, in the um, fiscal year 2020, that is a decreased cost because of the shift of the HVAC projects. In 2021, they have removed the design of a high school expansion. And in 2022, they have removed the construction of a high school expansion. So the school board approved CIP was requested for 52301243 They have a plan that's 32865032 which means we have a decrease of 19436211. I'll be happy to answer any specific questions. Some of this is just kind of a clarification. So sure. when this happens, is this a, a surprise or is there a consultation? Like when they move Lafayette's roof back a year, is that something that they're in co consultation with? Yes. Before with they and, move that project, okay, they ask so, us those questions about can it make it another year? Yes. Okay. We seek bond funding in 19 to support this. Yes, there's okay, constant so conversation. So there's constant back. So, so none of this is kind of a surprise, and it's all in consultation with the experts in our school system. Correct. And and every year we review this. I mean, it's a, it's a five year plan, but every year we review the CIP and and uh, emerging projects come in and other projects get reprioritized either way. So it's really a one year one year look and a one year one year uh, commitment and a four year plan. Correct. Um, again, I want to thank you. Um, you staff really uh, significantly improved upon the um, the process that um, that was used to develop this plan and I think it's just on a course for continuous improvement so thank you for putting those systems in place particularly that communication that Ms. Hummel asked about um, you know while it's somewhat disappointing that we weren't funded uh, in, in, in its entirety this year it, it is really um, wonderful that there are plans in place to think in the future and the out years, the gap's a little bit, you know, eye popping, but, um, you know, we have um, the Faithful and Gold report from two years ago, three years ago, two years, two years ago, revealed that we ha our facilities are in excellent condition um, and, you know, we need to be steadfast in ensuring that that continues. So I appreciate that partnership and this community has really invested in its in education, the quality of its educational infrastructure. And so I, I am very grateful for that. Um, we clearly take pride in our educational buildings, and that, that shows. Um, anyway, with that, I'm happy to support this. Are there any other comments before we take a vote? All right, it's been moved and seconded. Sir, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Okay, that brings us to item um, 8.04. Um, approval of the 2017-2018 Code of Conduct, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. This was discussed in full last night, last time, and Ms. Bourgeois brought the changes to the Code of Conduct, so it's ready for your consideration this evening. Thank you. But first, I have to ask for a motion. So, um, someone provide that for me, please. I um, move that we approve the 2017-2018 Code of Conduct. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Would anyone like to second? Second. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. We can skip forward. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments about the Code of Conduct? It's been seconded. Will you call the roll, Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Brings us to item 8.04, um, I mean 5, approval of the Carl D. Perkins grant 2017-2018. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move for the approval of the local plan and budget for the CTE Carl D. Perkins grant for school year 2017 to 2018. Thank you, Mrs. Young. May I have a second, please? Second. second. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Heron, any add? No, ma'am. Questions? Comments? 
I just want to thank the presentation that we had at the, at the uh, work session that it was the, in my years here that was the best that has ever been presented that I actually understand it so <laughs> thank you thank you um, all right it's been moved and seconded uh, we call the roll please Ms. Serza Mrs. Taylor aye Mrs. Young aye Dr. Beers aye Ms. Hummel aye Mr. Kelly aye Ms. Ownby aye <clears throat> Ms. Cook aye Motion passes. That brings us to 8.06, the annual contract renewable. Can I have a motion, please? I, mo oh. Go ahead, Julie. <laughs> I move that we approve the annual contract renewal book as presented. Second? Second. Okay. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Dr. Heron, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just that this is the annual contract and renewal book lists all employees who have been recommended for continued employment next year. Evening. Are there any comments or questions? Yeah. Um, except for those teachers who are on continuing contracts. Right, sir. So if, if someone pulls this up tomorrow and doesn't see their name in there, doesn't mean they don't have a job, it's because they are on a continuing contract. They're not on an annual contract. Because uh, that, that's what kind of threw me off when I reviewed this. I was like, I don't see a lot of names in here that I know. So, so yeah, we're good. Anything else? We moved and seconded. Will you call the roll, please, Ms. Serza? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. That brings us to 8.07. Salary schedules. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move we approve the pay scales and classification book for fiscal year 2017-2018 as Thank you, Ms. Ownby. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Taylor. Um, Dr. Heron? Madam Chair, this is just an adoption of a, the annual pay and classification book uh, for next year, outlining all of the, the positions in, in the school system. And it's the same as last year, is that correct? That's correct. Any questions? It is, it is the same as last year. The, um, and I just want to make sure that, that our, our teaching staff in particular understands that um, there are different tables for bachelor's degree, master's degree, master's plus 50, and, or plus 30, sorry, and then the doctoral, doctoral degree. Um, there's a, there seems to be some confusion out there that we're getting rid of things and doing that, and we're, we have not made no changes to the, to the teacher salary schedule. Um, get, we get the step, right? Next, next year, we haven't, we haven't adjusted the, the numbers on the, on the page from last year to this year, but uh, everybody who's eligible will take a step. We'll take a step, and so I, I just want to make sure that's communicated out there to our teaching staff that they understand those those uh, those different sliding scales and the opportunities there. So, because um, because I think there's a little bit of confusion out there. Anyway, Mr. Kelly, anybody else? All right, it's been moved and seconded. Will you call the roll, please, Ms. Serza? Zone B. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. And the motion passes. That uh, brings us to 8.08 .08, school, bus, school bus purchase. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the purchase of two school buses in the amount of $217,250 and the associated budget transfer. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. This continues our bus replacement cycle uh, for this year and actually finalizes it. And we are, as we discussed last time, we're using leftover vehicle fuel uh, dollars to purchase the two buses. Comments or questions? Mr. Kelly. And uh, Dr. Heron, Mr. Snipes, this, this is using this year, fiscal year's money, not next fiscal year's money. This is That's correct, sir. Anybody else? Motion's been made and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you please call the roll? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. That brings us to our last action item of the evening, which is 8.09, award a contract for invitation for bid number 17-11452, DJ, DJ Montague Elementary School Bus Canopy Construction Parking Lot and Sidewalk Project. 
Uh, can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we award the contract for invitation for bid number 17 11452, DJ Montague Elementary School bus canopy construction parking lot and sidewalk project to David A. Nice in the amount of $366,800. Thank you, Ms. Ombi. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Dr. Heron? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Snipes is here to answer any questions you may have about this item this evening. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Snipes? Um, I'd like to just clarify that uh, the request to transfer funds from the localities, can you update us on that, please? At the time the agenda was developed, we had not received confirmation from both the city and county that they agreed with the transfer in the amount of $76,453 from the Toana Middle School project. But since this agenda item was developed, both of the city and the county have approved that transfer. So we've got the money. Yes. OK, excellent. <laughs> Good question. Any, <laughs> any other questions or comments? OK, the motion has been made and seconded. Sirs, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. That brings us to item 9.01, Equity Through Engagement, Equitable Practices in Gifted Education. Dr. Heron, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're delighted to present the last in our Equity Through Engagement series for this year. And Alison Shepard, Coordinator of Gifted Services, is here to present Equitable, <coughs> equitable Practices in Gifted Education to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, Dr. Heron. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to present as a part of the series of Equity Through Engagement on behalf of the Office of Student Service and Gifted Education on the topic of equitable practices. Let me set the stage this evening as we consider ways to recognize students with intellectual potential but who may be from traditionally underrepresented populations in gifted programs, including minority, economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, or English language learners. We would like to share three areas we were working on to address disproportionality. The first is our collaboration with the Center for Gifted Education at William & Mary. Next are our professional development efforts in training kindergarten teachers. Finally is our Merging Scholars Program that addresses underrepresentation beginning in kindergarten. The first initiative has been our collaboration with the Center for Gifted Education at William & Mary. We began conversations in the fall of 2015. We wanted to increase the number of teachers in our division who were endorsed in gifted education. So we established a cohort of teachers who wanted to grow professionally by com completing the coursework to obtain the add-on gifted endorsement to their teaching license. William & Mary extended a discount to the tuition and in turn the school division understood the value of building capacity in its teachers and fully funded a cohort of 15 teachers. In fact, the teachers are about a week away from completing their coursework. Teachers learned about the social and emotional development of gifted learners, ways to develop curriculum and instruction, as well as program models in gifted education. Moreover, we are excited to announce that a second cohort will begin this fall. An informational meeting was held earlier this month, and teachers attended to learn about the gifted endorsement. Dr. Robbins from the center was there, as well as one of the current cohort participants, and boy, did he answer a lot of questions. Many applications continue to be sent out to teachers across the division. One of the teachers who participated in the cohort shared the experience, what it's been for him, and, and how he values the impact of the coursework. It's powerful to think about what will be the long range and long term positive effects on instruction across our division, and more specifically, increasing the number of endorsed teachers by 57%. Likewise, Mrs. Chambers, a participant in the cohort, she's a fifth grade education classroom teacher. She discussed how the coursework has impacted her instruction. I applied to the cohort because I knew I needed to provide better differentiation for my gifted students. It really has had a big impact. I've been able to differentiate by creating menus, making more independent, um, stations and activities 
for my gifted learners, really challenge them within the general education classroom. I get to see, you know, their different needs because they're not like all of the other kids. Every child is different. So with this coursework, I was able to see that they do have different needs and I can now reach those needs academically and emotionally for all of my students. The second area we wanted to share with you that addresses equity through engagement is our work with teams of kindergarten teachers to build an awareness of characteristics of students with intellectual potential from minority populations and who may be economically disadvantaged. Teachers are encouraged to consider all of their students, they serve in their classroom today, and they are asked to begin to link some of the characteristics to them. Then they receive their students' results from the universal screener we administer to all kindergarten students each year. I cannot tell you how rewarding and amazing it is to see those aha moments on the faces of the teachers. This year, I was particularly struck by one minority student who was developmentally delayed, an English language learner, and economically disadvantaged. She scored in the 99th percentile despite situational difficulties, and her classroom teacher and the principal had tears in their eyes. They recognize that in spite of her environmental barriers, here is a student with incredible potential, and they were so glad that they now would be able to nurture it moving forward. Mrs. Herkman, a kindergarten teacher, described the impact of not only the administration of the screener to the kindergarten students, but how the results inform students moving forward. One of the six schools who has received the training is James River. Mrs. Meadows, a kindergarten teacher, shares her thoughts about the training and at how it informs her instruction. The training session that we do each year um, has given us a different perspective for our students, especially those students in the underrepresented um, subgroups that we see in our classrooms. Um, for example, every year we've ranked our students um, and, and thought about the students we feel have great academic potential. And when we have the results shared with us, it gives us another perspective and, and pleasantly, um, we've been pleasantly surprised to find students in the underrepresented um, subgroups that have great academic potential. So the takeaway for us is we change our instruction. It gives us a perspective of what we need to do with those students to help fill in the gaps. Um, so that we see that potential in our classroom. And the third equity initiative we wanted to talk about this evening is in fact our Emerging Scholars Program, which identifies students in kindergarten and will serve students through fifth grade. We currently have students in grades one, two, and three. Right now, Emerging Scholars is in eight schools and we will be in all nine elementary schools beginning in the fall. Our equitable practices endeavor to mitigate this disproportionality. The researcher Bernal noted that the brightest of minority groups have been mostly unidentified, underidentified, or misidentified. Our Emerging Scholars Program is structured so students receive personalized services to help them grow academically. The Office of Gifted Education is often asked how our school division addresses issues of disproportionality. We share strategies and ideas. We use to find and serve these students with potential from minority populations. I once said to an administrator from another state, these strategies may seem like a drop in the bucket, to which she interrupted me and said, at least you have a bucket. Indeed. So who are our emerging scholars? As was mentioned earlier, we administer a universal screening assessment to all kindergarten students, and results are used to find students with intellectual potential, but may lack th who may lack three A's, access, affirmation, or advocates in the home. Families, they just may not know how to advocate educationally for their children. When people think about students in gifted programs, they often envision, envision advanced readers or students who are eager to learn, our emerging scholars have demonstrated potential, but they may present instead with out-of-the-box thinking skills or street smarts. However, they also may come to the program with low self-esteem, self-identity, or even self-confidence. We incorporate opportunities to grow them not only academically, but socially and emotionally. 
Students work with gifted resource teachers on a multifaceted curriculum that includes creative thinking activities, engineering and design challenges, chess, as well as other strategy games that help scholars build critical thinking and social skills. Gifted resource teachers introduce children's literature and get books in the home. In addition, activities with parents include breakfasts and storytelling. The goal is to build confidence and self-esteem while encouraging our students to pursue the most rigorous course of study possible as they progress through school. The restructured program began in 2014 with 17 first graders from four elementary schools. Since then, we've doubled the number of schools and tripled the amount of participation in grades one through three. This graph represents our emerging scholars. It shows growth in students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and minority student participation over time. These lines all show growth in the subgroups. It's important to note that students can fall into one, two, or three of these groups, and the majority of our students fall into two or more categories. Here is what one gifted resource teacher, Mrs. Chapel, had to say about the emerging scholars. In addition, see what our scholars do. The emerging scholar group has shown so much growth and so many changes from when they were initially identified in kindergarten to now, and my oldest group is in third grade. Uh, when they were younger, each week when they would come in, I got a lot of, I can't do that, or I'm, I don't think I can, can, and I would say, Let's, let's give it a try, okay? Now, when they come in each week, they burst through the door, they're eager to learn, they're eager to try the strategy games or technology activities or research, whatever we're working on, it's like, I can do this. And my hope is that they will go back to their regular classroom with that level of confidence and that they'll be leaders in their class and they, that they will grow to their academic potential. And I know they will. Here are a few quotes from our scholars and what they had to say about their experiences. I've got this, I can do it. Can I show this to my class? When one student was asked if he liked coming to Emerging Scholars, he responded, I love it. I mean, I really love it. In addition, a classroom teacher considered the value of the Emerging Scholars program. She said, I love the push for the Emerging Scholars. There are certain students who were found eligible in the past few years for whom I really think the opportunity can be life-changing. I want all of the children I teach to love learning, but for some, the outside factors can negatively impact the performance we see at school. So in summary, all three initiatives presented this evening, from the gifted cohort to the training for teachers to recognize gifted characteristics in underrepresented populations to the Emerging Scholars Program, are different ways we are trying to break the cycle of deficit thinking. The less we know about each other, the more we make up. We see their potential, meet their educational needs, and not focus on their deficits. Rather, we are committed to building equity through engagement with many varied stakeholder groups. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any left in you tonight. <laughs> what are you trying to say, Ms. Shepard? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Sure, what the heck, oh, yeah. right? Um, what a great program. I, I mean, that's about all I can, all I can really say to this. Uh, the, your graph, which shows uh, the growth of the program from 14, 15, 14, 15 through 16, 17, um, all I got to say is just keep it going. Thank you. We will. I like the slope it's on and just, just keep moving that. I think it's uh, important to, in, to engage all of, our, all of our students and to, and to identify all of those students who are um, gifted and, and need those services. So uh, thank you. Clarification. So this program is running tandem with the Visions program. Is there any overlap? Are these students with the kids that are identified as Visions? Or they're... Okay, it's a great question. There's a parallel track going on. The Merging Scholars program is really intended to be embraced by the school community. The gifted resource teacher is facilitating at this point, but as we grow and get more and more, we'll have other people possibly involved in the program. And Emerging Scholars isn't intended necessarily as a pipeline into a, uh, a 
formerly identified gifted program. At some point it could be, but this is providing the early and early access to give them the constructs that they may have come to school maybe that maybe weren't fully developed. Um, yeah, I, I um, fully support this effort. I think one of the things that's really important, and, and, and that's where the focus is, is, is also important, is um, you're reaching out to them at a very young age, and they're getting attention. They feel good, and you're stimulating them, and and, and there, there are many students with a variety of backgrounds that that's probably the single most important thing, and to also know what to do with them <laughs> once you get their attention. Uh, I, I just had a, I, I'm, I'm curious about the, because um, I think multiple gateways is, is, is really important. Can you, um, you know, just for everybody in general, you know, maybe identify what some of those are, because they're less traditional, aren't they, than what we've done in the past. And our gateways that we use for the emerging scholars specifically, because it's not a formal identity, formal identification process, the multiple gateways are really looking at a student holistically. What is the background? Do they have the access affirmation or advocates? What are the environmental variables that we can't control out of school? And we have great um, input by the kindergarten teachers, as well as, as I mentioned, this universal screener it gives us the ability to identify the students with intellectual potential, but who may need a little more support sure. early on. Um, interaction with the parents of these kids, is that, is that part, of, um, it's part of what you do? And then that's the part of the program that will probably be the next phase that grows um, more exponentially, because you can imagine it, at some of our schools, we don't have a huge cadre of students identified, sure. so the parents may be still a little reluctant. So. Sure. Um, I've been working with other members in the Office of Student Services to develop um, a survey for our families, have it in uh, Spanish. What are some of the activities you might like to see in the summertime that are available or have, are easily accessed? And uh, some of the things that we've done in the past, like I said, we've had um, worked with SHIP. Sure. Thankfully, they're there. And I think that's, it's, you know, reaching out to them, um, because many of them uh, may have had similar beginning experiences, on, which, which were quite different from and so I think that uh, it's just another way of reinforcing it. Really. Absolutely. I think, thank you for the update. This is really fantastic to know about. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I'm curious if you've observed any, if you've had any observations as you identify these emerging scholars in kindergarten, whether there's any, if you see any commonality with preschool, any preschool um, uh, Enrollment, or, or generally speaking, are these, do these kids have no preschool, um, or is there any connection there? Have you made any observation about that? Or I, actually, that's a great question. I'd have to look into that for you. I've, we find them once we get into kindergarten, and we have that potential piece, and then we realize what some of maybe some areas that there are gaps, and that's when we take them and we try to move them forward to measure student growth. Okay. Um, which okay. Go ahead, go. No, no, I, you, you, uh, you mentioned uh, in, even prior to um, kindergarten, um, and you don't have to, I don't need to know now, but I'd be curious to know how many bright beginnings, kids, you know, the really, really young ones, how many of them um, sort of are, are either selected or, or rise to the, rise to that, you know, that, um, that gateway stage where they started and how early we we find them um, that would be a great that'd be a great summer project um, and this and actually and to follow up if you're if you if you move forward and look at our third graders this will be the first time we'll be able to get a sense is it working are we having an impact on student growth we had the anecdotal what the scholars said and what, what mrs. Chapel said about seeing student growth from first to third this will be the first year when those data um, points are returned later I guess later this month we'll be able to do some disaggregating and I'm looking forward to that that was my second question, so oh, you just I'm answered. No, 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 it was great. So thank you. Yeah, I would love to, once you're able to uh, draw some conclusions, um, I would love to, uh, you know, you've got the ability side down, but on that, you know, what achievement and have you seen anything measurable there? So I would be happy to, to get that information. I'd love to, to know that. It's, it's, um, it's wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, 
Dr. Heron, did you want to add anything? Just a comment that Ms. Shepard, this really existed in name only until three years ago. Three? And she really has brought it to life in our school system, and I really do feel we're going to reap the benefits in, in the years ahead. Um, as with all the equity presentations, many of them will involve bringing you updates on data to show you the, the continued impact of the many strategies that we've brought to you over the, the several last several months. I um, just want to thank Ms. Shepard in person. Thank you. Thank you very it's been much. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That brings us to um, item 10.01, board member comments. And uh, Mrs. Young, do you have anything? I do. Okay, first of all, I want to, uh, last week was Teacher Appreciation Week. I want to thank all of our teachers. I, I don't think we can thank them enough for all that they do for our students. And um, I remember being a teacher and, and know what that involves, and so I just want to thank them. Also, I was able to attend two uh, Berkeley Middle School plays uh, a week ago Friday. Uh, one was called um, the NSA's Guide to How to Win Friends and Influence People, and uh, a more serious play called The Holocaust. They were performed by 7th and 8th graders. And um, I can't wait to see in a few years where some of those actors and actresses are going to be. Or I guess they're just called actors now. So, um, which was um, pretty amazing. Um, when I was elected to the school board, uh, I was told two things. First, that our only employee was the superintendent. And secondly, that our job was to create policy uh, we see that in our monthly meetings as we seek to create policy that improves the education of all children in the school division and um, that, that we've been entrusted with. Uh, when our focus is taken off those policies that advance the individual, off every child reaching their full potential, then we are not achieving our sole purpose for being here. Uh, we should be focusing on raising all students up, and I think our equity presentation tonight shows that that is uh, being um, that is happening in our school district uh, words have consequences and great philosophers and thinkers have used words throughout the ages to forward ideas and ideals for centuries and many of those these ideas and the ideals have better societies and cultures and then there are words that create ideas that divide civilizations and words that create philosophies that harm societies and that foment anger and hatred and sometimes these philosophies um, seek to lay blame at the feet of one group or another. And in my opinion, these should be rejected. At our work session on May 2nd, um, during board comments, an article in the Virginia Gazette was referenced. I was shocked by it. Um, I was not trying to show disrespect to the, to the board member who did it, but I was shocked that that article was brought up. Uh, the, the idea of white privilege is an academic ph philosophy that attempts to explain some of the injustices in our societies. And while it has been around for uh, many years, in, in fact, since 1983, uh, it has garnered more attention since 2014. And um, I don't necessarily think that it's producing positive results. And in my opinion, any philosophy that seeks to lay blame at the feet of a single group is oversimplistic and removes responsibility and accountability from each individual for reaching their goals and full potential. Uh, we were not asked when we were born, what color are you want to be? What sex do you want to be? Where do you want to live? It's, it's a matter of happenstance. And uh, it amazes me that anyone can detect and identify the implicit or explicit bias of a person merely by looking at their skin color. Uh, if you identify bias in yourself, that's a positive thing, and that's something that we can strive to remedy, and that's a personal decision. But to determine that an entire group shares that bias is naive, uh, counter to common sense, and is potentially dangerous. Uh, I, I'm a child of this child, um, the civil rights era. I was alive then. I hate to admit that, but I was. And during that time, I was a young person, about 25, and I celebrated and I participated in that movement. And it was created to counter mistreatment, prejudice, and inequality of our African-American citizens. And how backwards we are traveling to now create racism and bias against another group, and in this case, white-skinned people. And I reject that dogma, 
ideology or a philosophy that denigrates or diminishes one race, culture, religion, or sex to advance another or any theory designed to encourage group think. It is ill-advised, it's not sound, and nor, in my opinion, does it belong in the venue of the public school. I want, just want to read a brief quote, and I do appreciate uh, this being forwarded to me, um, because I, when I read it, I was kind of taken aback. The person who wrote this, I think, truly... Um, was trying to share their own feelings. And I have no issue with anyone that wants us to develop sensitivity towards other people. But this person said, looking back, however, I have come to realize that I was in fact privileged in ways that many people of all races were not. I was privileged to grow up in a home where education was valued, achievement, achievement was expected, discipline was enforced, and the work ethic was learned by example. I am satisfied that the cultural environment of my youth had many, much more to do with my success in life than my whiteness ever did, and with that I truly agree. But I, do, I, I believe that parents, that many parents, not all, certainly not all, but most parents want what is best for their children. They want their children to achieve. They want their children's education to be valued, and they want discipline to be enforced. And they are striving to create a work ethic in their children. It's certainly something that um, I try to do with my children. So I hope that as a school division that we will continue. And I applaud uh, the work of our cabinet in developing uh, these presentations on equity. I certainly hope we will continue to, to move forward in that direction. Because equity for all students is truly what education is all about. And I, I thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Mr. Kelly, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I particularly thank you for calling on me before Mrs. Owenby. So unlike last meeting, I have some material left to talk about. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, all of our high school musicals are wonderful, and, and the last one with War Hill, A Little Shop of Horrors, was um, okay. right up there with all the rest of them. I mean, I think it was... Uh, um, uh, um, I uh, really appreciated that. Uh, as we come towards the end of the year, we have um, lots of uh, events, retirement ceremony and uh, service pin presentations that we have on Thursday. Uh, my, probably my most favorite ceremony is the GED completion ceremony. Um, uh, coming up in June, first part of June, and then the graduation shortly thereafter. Um, right now, our schools are in the midst of SOLs and uh, uh, the teamwork by all the staff to put those uh, to get those SOLs completed, and in accordance with all the rules, I just want to thank all the staff members out there who are uh, working to do that. Uh, it was my privilege last week to be a part of a tour of the Newport News Shipbuilding Apprentice School with Dr. Heron. Um, it's always a pleasure to show off our school and the, and the, the great uh, um, career uh, options that are available at the school. And so I, th I thank Dr. Heron for making that visit. Um, and Madam Chair, as we approach the middle of the year uh, and graduation, I think it's appropriate to reflect on where we are and where we are going. Um, being chair is a tough job. Um, you have to deal with a lot of issues and situations, some of which are not in the public record, and uh, some of you are not even brought to the individual board members' attention. Um, as you well know, I don't always agree with you, but I just wanted to say publicly how much I appreciate your leadership and ensure that you know you have both my admiration and my support. So, thank you, Mrs. Cook. Ms. Owenby, is there anything left for you to say? Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I too attended Little Shop of Horrors, and I still have the, the song in my head because that is my all time favorite. The, I know, I know. Then the doo wop girls were just the bomb. Um, but wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Garris and the all district fifth grade. Um, Band, which represented Stonehouse, Matoka, DJ, and Nord. So they did a great job. These students have come so far as, as fifth grade musicians, and I can't wait to see them when they get to middle school. Um, likewise, Mr. Francis, I have to give a shout out to him with the Hornsby Spring um, Band concert. I want to give a shout out to PTA Council. 
um, and Laura Tripp, who is here and is graduating from PTA Council. Um, but PTA Council provides a huge support and service to all of our PTAs, and so, uh, and I think that we, our council has, has gone above and beyond from the days when Kara and I served on PTA Council. I think the level of support that you provide to our PTAs, particularly with auditing and the Audit Fest, um, is huge for our parent volunteers. So thank you for, for all of your efforts to do that. Um, I too had planned to give a shout out to, to the lacrosse game, because I was <laughs> told to, because uh, a member of my family is really close to one of the players, but, but wanted to let folks know that the number one and number two seeds are, are Lafayette and Jamestown, and so um, and there is a push to have lacrosse be recognized um, as a Virginia High School League um, <clears throat> sport. But I wanted to note that, that it are, it's, it's, it's two of our, uh, our, our hometown schools. Um, well, and I had an opportunity to tour Claire Baker, and I'm going to let her talk about that. No, you can talk about it. But I did want to say I was amazed by the walking tours. And so um, Mike Hurley and Angel Washington, because of where they're geographically located, have an opportunity to have their students go into the community to do um, hands-on, real-life learning. So they are learning math in the local grocery store, and they can walk there, and that doesn't impact transportation. Um, and they can go to the bank, which is right across the street, and they can go to McDonald's and, again, make change. And so I just thought that was really cool. And, and really, there's only a couple of our schools who have an opportunity to do that because of where they're located. Um, and just wanted to give accolades to the facelift to Clearwood Baker. It had been a long, long time since I'd been in that school, but it's a very happy, happy place to walk into um, with, with the renovations that were done, I guess, wrapped up at this beginning of the school year. Um, my comments now, I think, are very timely. Um, and can in response maybe to some of, of what um, Mrs. Young brought up. Uh, Jim Kelly and I did attend the NAACP Lifetime Membership Awards Banquet a few weeks ago and um, appreciate the opportunity to learn more from speakers about the NAACP's history, past, and current goals. I spoke with many folks, uh, but in particular Mr. Tony Conyers, who is well-respected um, native Williamsburg. Um, he graduated from our school system. His children graduated from our school system. He's a former commissioner of our state rehabilitation um, office. And he shared with me and Mr. <coughs> Kelly his frustration with the fact that there has been little narrowing of the achievement gap uh, for students of color in the last 50 years, 50 years. And the same issues and obstacles to achievement still persist. Um, we talked about the link between truancy, the pipeline to prison, and the fact that uh, the community continues to fail to adequately meet the needs, educational needs, of a significant group of students, students of color, and I would also add students with disabilities and English language learners. I asked him what he thought about implicit bias, and he did agree that that was a starting place. He and his contemporaries feel that certain students are still tracked because of the color of their skin. I think that my conversation with Mr. Conyers was timely, as, as all of us have just gotten back from the NSBA conference, the National School Board Association conference, and I had an opportunity to attend several sessions to learn more about implicit bias and what some of our neighboring school systems are doing, like Virginia Beach, who is, who is addressing that um, in a very systematic way, school by school, um, really examining what implicit bias means and how we can address that. I feel strongly that the WJCC school board owes it to this community to acknowledge the fact that implicit, implicit bias does exist. Um, we have room to grow with cultural sensitivity and ensuring all students achieve. A starting point is to publicly acknowledge the very real and intangible barriers that exist for our students of color. And I'll share um, a, a conversation that I had with my 10th grade daughter who's at Lafayette, was in her AP Human class just a couple weeks ago, and the issue of implicit bias um, was discussed as well as, as white privilege. And, and it was a very hearty conversation that was um, mediated by the, the teacher. And there were students there who felt very strongly, as does Miss Young, that it does not exist. And then there were students of color who made it very clear that it is very real. And so I think to say that it doesn't exist is a disservice to many students. Um, and I'm fairly confident that quote that you referred to, Mrs. Young, is in the commentary that I referred to at the work session. That, that quote is, is written by the man who talked about white privilege. So oh, it was. Dr. Beers? Uh, yes. I just have three things to say. Um, those students who have taken SOLs this week or so, I have my fingers crossed for you, <laughs> <clears throat> and for the rest of you, uh, and all the rest who have forward to the undeniably uh, disagreeable, and I don't know why they're totally necessary, but uh, <clears throat> but those who have um, 
uh, who have those to take in the next few weeks. Wish you good luck on that. Um, I um, was. I I must say. Uh, third thing. Second thing was. I very much um, like to uh, reiterate my uh, support of that uh, breakfast initiation. Dr. Carroll, I think that really, um, this is a starting point, and, and I, I just, I can't believe that's not going to catch on and spread. Um, because it is difficult having, they're in their 40s now, but having uh, raised, um, it's a still related, <laughs> having, having raised several kids who uh, did get up at the crack of dawn, even before the crack of dawn. I think they would very much have appreciated, especially the um, berry smoothie in the morning. <laughs> would have been great. I made them lunch, but they really could have used that breakfast. Last thing. Um, the last thing is um, um, I uh, also um, congratulate uh, the incredible um, dedication and, and, and real competence of uh, support staff. These are, many of these people are unknown to the public that um, are the glue that really um, help to keep um, the school district running as successfully as it does. Uh, three, one. Okay. Ms. Hummel. <clears throat> um, I wanted to thank uh, Mrs. Ownby for going to the middle school band concerts. So that elementary and elementary band concerts, I I commend you for that, and I don't have to go to those anymore. So thank you for that. Anyway, I'm just apologies. So don't don't get upset. But it was just I've been to a lot of elementary and middle school band concerts. So there's a lot of emerging talent. There's a lot of emerging talent. Anyway, and I wanted to also appreciate the teachers, the support staff. Um, the swim team that came up, uh, those those uh, swimmers, boy, talk about people who don't mind getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, I my hat is off to them. Um, I wanted to say that I am unfortunately not going to be at the graduation uh, coming up in June. I will be on a work uh, a work visit to Dr. Heron's country of Ireland. So I will be missing that, and um, so anyway, you can, you can live stream. I could live stream it. <laughs> I could live stream it. But. And I also have enjoyed my tours of Clear Bird Baker, James River, uh, and I really look forward to my uh, biweekly meetings with Holly Taylor for policy reviews. That concludes my comments. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hummel. This is Taylor. Um, to echo Ms. Hummel's sentiments, um, <laughs> many thanks to all our volunteers and support staff who were recognized tonight. And also congratulations to our student athletes who we recognized as well. Um, so sadly, I will not be at our retirement ceremony, which is unfortunate because I, I very much enjoyed that event uh, last year. But on a happy note, um, I will be going to policy committee tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and I was also able to visit Matoka with Ms. Cook last week. It was a great visit with Mr. Jacobs and... Um, I, too, really enjoyed honoring all the volunteers and support staff, and I was wondering, because there's time between the applause and then they're making their way here, that I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what they do. How do they volunteer? What kind of support staff are they? So I would like to request that a year from now, maybe just a word or two about the type of volunteer work and the type of um, work that the support staff members do, at, um, because I think it would be really nice to better understand um, how they contribute to our school community. So if I make that request, I'd be grateful. I also want to thank all of you um, for your hard work on both budgets. You asked a lot of good questions, um, and I, I actively uh, engaged with staff to help them construct something that we could all support. Um, so I just think that, um, obviously, the bulk of the work is with Dr. Heron and her team, and Ms. Berta and her and her team. But um, it happens; it's, it, we're 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 a team, and it happens because we all work hard together. So I just want to thank you because it's not it's no easy task. 
Uh, I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to all the teachers, uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, and particularly the PTAs that support them in every building. Um, some of the, I mean, there's massage stations and breakfasts, and just it's really, um, hopefully, um, they're feeling the love. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mrs. Taylor and Ms. Hummel. We talked a little bit about policy, but as I read through that consent agenda at our second meeting each month, it's quite a, you know, it's a handful, and you guys are doing that with staff. So thank you for carrying that water for us and making sure that we're really um, reviewing those. Mrs. Young mentioned that in, in um, her remarks that it's one of the most important things we do. So thank you for bringing all of that to us. A Little Shop of Horrors, I cannot get the song out of my head. It's going to be months, I think. Um, but it was that was a lot of fun. And then I also wanted to give a shout out. I think we have a Boy Scout uh, in, the, in the audience. Are, are you getting a badge? E Excellent. So yeah, you picked a long one. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Thank you, David, for leading us in the pledge and for um, what you do in the community. So, if there's not if there's anything else, go on to item 10.01, um, which is um, I'm sorry, 11.01, upcoming events tomorrow uh, on the 17th of May at 4 p.m. The policy committee meets at the annex in the school board, room 309. Um, also mentioned tonight is the re retirement and pin ceremony on the 18th of May at 5 p.m. at the William Mary School of Education. On Friday the 19th, we have VSBA board development at the VSB offices in Charlottesville. On the 23rd of May, the 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee meets at 4 p.m. in the school board central office in room 108. On the 25th of May at 5.30 p.m., staff has put together a Freedom of Information Act workshop, uh, um, workshop for us so we make sure we're compliant with FOIA and know all about it. And that's in room 300 in the annex at James Blair. And then on the 31st of this month, um, the school liaison committee meets. The city is hosting, I believe, and the location is TBD. Okay, great. Did I miss any other upcoming events? That's enough. Okay. That's a, and then next is uh, upcoming meetings, item 11.02. Uh, on June 6th, we go into closed session at 6 o'clock in, uh, in the annex of, the, of James Blair, and then follow that with a work session at 6.30. And then on the 20th of June, we go into closed session at 6 o'clock here in the Stryker Center and follow that at 6.30 with a regular meeting. And uh, unless there's anything else, we'll adjourn the meeting.